Good morning from Belfast City Centre and welcome to our live coverage of the 12th. Now the spectators have been gathering here for the past couple of hours and the crowds are huge. We are live with you for the next hour and a quarter as the Orange Order marks the 323rd anniversary of the Battle of the Boyne. Now you can keep up to date with everything that's happening on BBC Newsline, on Radio Ulster and on our online services. Now, we'll be with the Belfast Parade in just a moment, but to get out and about a bit, we're also covering the parade in Macrofelt Live, and we can now join Ralph McLean. Thanks very much, Helen. There is a real buzz about Macrofelt this morning. The sun is shining. Boy, is it shining. And there's a real atmosphere in the streets as well. It's a really great day here, no question about it. Now, the procession left the town centre a few minutes ago. It'll be joining us here at our position on the Moneymore Road shortly. Uh, we're talking about 60 bands here and around about 2,000 Lodge members as well taking part in the South London Dairy demonstration. So this is a big one. We will have the delights of the Lambeg drum a bit later as well for you. I'm hoping to catch up with one player of that amazing instrument a bit later on in the programme. But for now, Back to Belfast and Walter Love. Thanks, Ralph, and good morning from our commentary position on the corner of Ormo Avenue. There has been a little bit of delay because the Orange Order have been making a protest at the Parades Commission office here in Bedford Street. But the colourful scene here, benefiting from the exceptional hot spell we've been having, a very hot day, perhaps the hottest for some time, warmer, I'm told, than Malaga. We can now take a look at uh, the route the parade will take here in Belfast from Clifton Street to Donegal Street, then Royal Avenue past Castle Junction into Donegal Place, Donegal Square West, Bedford Street, Dublin Road, through Shaftesbury Square, up the, uh, through uh, Bradbury Place first and then up the Lisburn Road, uh, left into Balmoral Avenue, and then the top of the Malone Road into Barnet's Domain. But well, I'm joined this morning by Dr. Gavin Hughes, historian from Trinity College in Dublin. Gavin, a very good morning to you. Good morning, Walter. And isn't it a very glorious morning here in the top of Bedford Street? I think always one hopes for sunshine for the, the, the day because the colours come through spectacularly on a day like this. And no wind, which is also a great help for the banner carriers. Absolutely. So this is the scene now in, in Bedford Street with the Miller Memorial Band in uh, Flute Band in uh, pride of place here at the head of the procession, formed over a hundred years ago in 1911 and very smart in their blue uniforms. Very distinctive style to them. Absolutely, no, Walter. I mean, um, the Miller Memorial, I think, traditionally um, do head up this uh, parade on the Belfast 12th, don't they? Of the and, uh, County Gand. Orange Lodge, Belfast Band Number One. It's the 150th anniversary of County Grand Lodge, isn't it? It is indeed. And the County Colour Party carrying the Rice Memorial Standards. Um, Eric Brewster is head of the Colour Party, and uh, the County Officers, of course, here as well, uh, including County Grand Master George Chittick, member of Number Five District Sandy Row, and it's his first year as County Grand Master. And a fine band, very precise uh, group of musicians making their way at the head of the parade in Belfast. Yes, very smart indeed. The crowds here, as, as Helen was saying, have been gathering from earlier this morning, and I don't think I've ever seen so many people in, in Bedford Street here uh, as normally it attracts quite a good crowd, but this is huge. There are thousands of people here between here and uh, Donegal Square, west of the, the back of our, our view. And uh, all dressed for a summer occasion. Not every 12th is as hot and sunny as this. That's going to be possibly a, a problem for some of the, the marchers. Six miles from Clifton Street to the field and then six miles back again later this afternoon. Well, I was just noticing the reenactors there, Walter, and they will probably be very, very hot by the time they get to uh, Barnet Domain. Um, passing us, uh, there's a, a symbol which is always on the banners, uh, the uh, Bible and crown. 
The parade is led this year by District Number 6, Ballymacarrett, and uh, the district includes 30 lodges with 20 bands and, and one ladies' district. And I think, I, I believe that uh, there are more ladies taking part in the parade now than used to be the case. Altogether in the Belfast Parade there are 130 lodges taking part with 66 bands and an interesting thing about the bands is that about a third of them, 21 or so, come from Scotland. There's always been a very strong uh, presence by Scottish orange uh, men uh, in the parade each year. Valley McCarrot, uh, Prentice Boys, Temperance Lodge 398, and uh, the Pride of the Hill flute band, Corn Money. Yes, the uh, star of Down Temperance, uh, Walter, that was uh, formed in 1908 when well, Brother Reverend uh, Crooks reviewed the warrant uh, for two pounds uh, and uh, six shillings. And I should have mentioned Parkinson Accordion Band from East Belfast, who celebrated their 60th anniversary last year. Uh, they were established in 1952, and they've walked with the lodge since 1966. That's why right. we've got a lovely shot of uh, Bally McCarrick, Prince Boy's Temperance banner there, of uh, the front of William Crossing the Boyne, and uh, the uh, old verse, the Bible and Crown there. A bannerette will also be carried highlighting the friendship between this lodge and King William uh, 102 from Paisley in Scotland. Members of this uh, uh, <coughs> the oldest lodge in Scotland who celebrated their 200th anniversary this year, Walter, established in 1813. And Women's District Number 2 District is also present here in this part of the parade with District Mistress Sonia Copeland. See, um, as we look down here on this, uh, the length of, of Bedford Street here, on this lovely sunny morning, there is now a little bit of cloud in the sky, which might mean that later, I don't know with the weather member this morning, we're talking about the possibility of one or two isolated showers, but certainly it's a, it's a wonderful morning here, beautiful morning, beautiful summer morning. Well, now I can hand over to Helen Mark, who's down here in the crowd in the street in Bedford Street. Helen. Hello, Walter. Let me introduce you to Grant Dillon. Now, Grant is with the uh, 1588 Loyal Orange Lodge. What, what one is that, Grant? Uh, it's Craig and Offenders, which is in number 6 District in Ballamacarrad in the east of the city. And I believe that you're celebrating a little bit of an anniversary for yourself today. Well, yes, it's my 30th anniversary with this lodge. But I've been walking and parading for about 35 years since a wee boy. A tiny wee boy. A tiny wee boy. Out, out at them. the front of the, the parade, were you? Uh, yes, yes. My, my, I was carrying the string in my late father's lodge. So, yeah, it's uh, it's been a, a long time with me, as they say. Yes, and it's very often a family tradition, isn't it? The son follows the father. Yes, absolutely. And here we are in Belfast today, and there is another anniversary which is being celebrated, 150 years. Yes, the City of Belfast County Grand Orange Lodge are 150 years old this year. Uh, they were formed in 1863, and through that 150 years, obviously, we've grown and grown and grown. Um, and today, there will be about 20,000 people in Belfast. And we actually were told yesterday that there will be about a quarter of a million people taking part in all the orange parades and celebrations in Northern Ireland today. So it's, it's marvellous, marvellous. Huge numbers. Um, we're just watching the bands go past, and in this sunlight, the colours look absolutely fantastic. I wonder if an order came from above that you were all allowed to march in your shirt sleeves today. Well, normally, being an ex-serviceman's lodge, we wear bowler hats, yes. uh, bowler hats and jackets off today. Still wear gloves, though. <laughs> Uh, but yes, it's uh, but it's good. And some of the lodges still within the Belfast County will still wear their bowler hats, which is nice to see, particularly some of those ex-servicemen's lodges. 
Well, I think one of the nice things with the Belfast County, which they've been able to do in the last few years, uh, you know, is outreaching. And as you can see around the City Hall, there's lots of activity for people to do today. So it's very much a celebration for everyone, we hope. Well, are you uh, hoping to catch up with your uh, parade, your part of the parade shortly? Will you have to hot-foot it anywhere? Are you, are you waiting for them to pass us by? Well, well, well uh, hopefully my lodge should be coming back in about 20 minutes' time, Helen, so I, I, I can nip in quite yeah. quickly. Well, enjoy the walk to the field in this great heat. Thank you very much. Very great heat, Walter. Phew! <laughs> very much so indeed, uh, Helen. Thank you very much indeed. Right at the background there of uh, the view down Bedford Street is the Linen Hall Library, one of the fine old buildings of Belfast. In fact, really, when you look from here uh, down the street, you've got uh, a mixture, really, of old Belfast and some of the newer buildings as well. And uh, there's one of the newer skyscrapers in Belfast, and there's the Ewart building, because there was a time... Uh, when there were many linen warehouses in this part of Belfast. Uh, that's one of the old relics of uh, Victorian Belfast, perhaps. And uh, that lovely view down here gives us a very good view of the parade as it approaches us here at the junction of Ormo Avenue and uh, Bedford Street. And I think uh, coming up is um, Cook's Defenders, Walter. On front of their banner is the uh, statue of Black Man, the Reverend Henry Cook. Um, and on the back of this is William III leaving Belfast Castle. One of the problems, I imagine, for those taking part in the parade is if you're halfway between two bands, how do you <laughs> yes. get there? This is it, isn't it? Um, I suspect you either um, march to the one in front or march to the one in back, whichever tune you prefer. Very smart uniforms indeed. Very much so. And one of the things too, the uh, ribbon men, I suppose, uh, young youngsters who are involved from a very early age in the traditions of the of the twelve. They are, and they certainly look to be enjoying themselves. This is looking along the length of the Dublin Road up towards Shaftesbury Square. Yes, there's a young lad practicing to be a drum major. Oh, well, can he catch it? Can he catch Adios, it? Yeah. <laughs> Certainly, the street is is full of the sounds of uh, of the bands. Position between the, the different lodges here in, in District Number 6 leading the parade today. As long as, as well as I should say, the, the parade here in Belfast, of course, there are demonstrations all over the province, and in Maherfeld, we're joining now Ralph McLean. Thank you, Walter. Yeah, the sun's still beating down like a lambeg drum here. The bands have arrived in earnest, and it is all about a great family day out, and you can sense that here in the streets. Joined by Lisa Brown. Lisa, this is a massive family day out, isn't it? It's a wonderful day. It's a glorious day, and it's great to be able to be here with friends and with family, and just to celebrate our culture, and remember the sacrifice that our forefathers made that enable us still today to come out and worship God, and maintain the Holy Scriptures, and walk the roads, and be proud of our culture. And you've got the family down here today. Who's here today? I have my son. My husband's walking in the lodge. He's just coming up behind me. And I have the rest of the extended family and friends. And, of course, it's all about getting a prime position. Tell me about the etiquette of getting a good position here. You've got the motorhome out. You've got a prime position on the Moneymore Road here, just around the corner from us. How do you do that? How do you get the, the best position here? Well, we have family who came down in the motorhome yesterday morning at about 11 o'clock. And then we came down and we're just a few spaces up from them and we parked the car last evening at half five. <laughs> That's what you've got to do. You've got to plan ahead, haven't you? Now, tell me just a little bit about it. It is fantastic here. It's a massive day for Macrofelt. You're from Macrofelt. It's very important, isn't it? It is. It's great for the town of Macrofelt. It's great to see so many people in the town of Macrofelt and just supporting the local businesses. Brilliant, Lisa. Enjoy the rest of the day with your family. Great Thank to speak you. to you. Walter, back to you in Belfast. Thank you, Ralph. We'll be returning, of course, to Macrofelt uh, during the course of our transmission here between now and uh, quarter past 12. The 
more than just hearing the strains of the uh, pride of Govan Luke Band, a very large band, uh, Walter. And the Crown and Bible there on uh, this banner. Yes, that's uh, <coughs> number 891, Beersbridge Road, Bible and Crown Defenders, Walter. Um, this lodge will be joined by Pendle Sons of Ulster, uh, number 25, Burnley, England, and brethren from across Scotland. Yes, because obviously uh, quite a number of, of visiting lodges from Scotland particularly, but also from England as well. That's right. And uh, we notice here a very military-looking band as well, Gertrude Starr. Now, is the tradition of holding parades and marches on the 12th of July related to similar events elsewhere, would you say? Um, it is, Walter. The military tradition of parading with bands and flags is a very ancient one indeed. Um, but in more recent times, the 12th probably takes its lead from other similar events, such as the Trooping of the Colour. Well, this began in 1748 as the official marking of the monarch's birthday, but it has its origins dating back to the beginning of the 18th century, and perhaps even to the Williamite period itself. Indeed, this 12th, uh, as you can see today, st stylistically echoes this tradition of trooping, or literally parading your colours and flags so that they can be easily recognised and indeed honoured. And uh, the, the colour escorts, too, would presumably have a, a military presence. Well, they do, want. Yes, you'll notice at the head of lodges and bands we see groups carrying flags and bannerets. These effectively replicate the historical military practice of forming an elite guard of veterans, or colour guards and colour escorts, whose job it was to protect the flag at all costs when on the battlefield. The flag or standard represents the honour and pride of the unit, and consequently it would become a much sought-after prize for enemy on the battlefield. Practically, it was also a rallying point for troops during the confusion of battle, and the loss of a unit's flag was a source of great humiliation. Um, but as you see, the, the banners there, uh, some of them are allowed to be um, let loose and not tied up today. It's also a, a point, uh, I think, saying that uh, on, a, on a windy day, it's, it must be quite a strain to carry a banner in, in high winds. I would imagine so. Um, the... The weight of the banners, whenever they're getting tugged by the wind, must be very difficult to control. And of course, they're very expensive items, and if they tear... Oh, a lot of indeed. young people, and even at this time of the morning, it's time to have a, have a little bit of a nap. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Here again, we see the, the, the huge crowds here in Bedford Street. Have you seen as many crowds before this, Walter? I, I think this is bigger this year uh, than, than previous year, and that may be a, a factor of the weather, I think. It's a sort of go out and do something day today. It is. We see Whitehall Defenders Flute Band and the Star Wells Temperance, uh, 1085 LOL, with Ballymacarrot Orange Hall on the front of their banner there. Actually, the uh, warrant for that lodge was issued in Cork in 1824, but has been reissued many times before becoming Star of Ulster Temperance in 1920. So there's a great deal of history here in front of us. There is. And a lot of people coming here for the day. I think probably uh, we've got a lot of people who are visitors to Belfast here watching, watching the parade this year. And I expect Helen will be finding a few people to talk to from different parts of the world. Oh, we've got a lovely shot there of the, uh, the parade as it comes past, and a beautiful shot of many banners and flags. Kaleidoscope of colour, isn't it? It is. Well now, uh, again in the crowd, uh, let's go over to Helen Mark again. Well here we are, I, when you're walking uh, along the streets here, it's amazing how many different accents you hear. And of course my ears break to these two accents because they're both Scottish. They're from the Glasgow area, so I'll let them introduce themselves. You are? Yeah, I'm Martin, I'm from Coatbridge. And you are? Gordon, Canada. <laughs> Canada, you would never know from the accent. Are you new to Canada? No, I've lived there 47 years, sweetheart. <laughs> you sound what? fresh. Yeah. Fresh from the cloud, you sound. I'll lose it when I find a better one. <laughs> and how is it that you are both here today? 
Well, we decided Gordon was coming over. We did the parade in Scotland last week, and we decided that we'd take a trip over here because it's been so long since we've been here, and decided we wanted to come and see it and make a whole weekend of a reunion type thing. A reunion? After how long is it since you've been here? Thirty years. And how's the reunion going? Very well, very well. Like uh, we come over to Scotland maybe every second, third year, but this year is a special one. Why? Well, I'm also a member of the Orange Jordan, so I gave up the parade in Canada to come here, walk here in Edinburgh, in my hometown, Cole Bridge, and then visit Belfast. And what do you think of the parade here today? Oh, it's absolutely fantastic. And of course, the weather makes it. It brings out the colour, it brings out the happy, smiling faces. It's great. It's tremendous. And what are your thoughts? I think it's... Well, this is the home of the Orange Order, and God's always good to his own. That's why we get good weather. Well, enjoy the music and the parade as it goes past. And thank you very much for stopping to speak to me. And all the very best. Right. <laughs> Back to you, Walter. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Helen. Uh, it's uh, quite a challenge, I imagine, talking with the volume of sound coming from the bands passing just a few feet away. We move now from District 6 to two combined districts, 7 and 8. Now, these were smaller districts. I think when a lot of people were moved out of Belfast, uh, out of the city, uh, it obviously reduced the number of people in some of the, the lodges. And so District 7 and 8, two of the smaller districts, are combined. And they consist of six lodges with three bands. back uh, in history do parades go in terms of orange parades? Well, look, Walter, there have been links with the British Army in Orangism since its very earliest days. But Belfast itself witnessed military and, and uh, civic parades from as early as 1778, when two Belfast companies of volunteers paraded with fife and drums on the 1st of July, and certain companies of volunteer movement paraded in like form on a regular basis. Um, Three uh, volunteer companies paraded, for example, on the 1st of July, 1799, in full uniform with orange cockades in their hats to celebrate the Battle of the Boyne, just like we're seeing here today. And again, uh, people of all ages here are enjoying a family day out uh, and dress for the weather. Now we get a very good shot there of the, of the fifers coming up. You'll see a predominance of fife and drums in the bands uh, in evidence today, Walter, I think. Yes, much more than pipe bands, which used to be fairly predominant, less so today. So a beautiful shot there of, of the bands coming up um, Bedford Street again. I think a lot of people uh, stake out a claim to a part of the pavement here. Traditionally, I think... Maybe you see the same families appearing every year. Lovely flowers decorating the, uh, the banner. Very much shirt sleeve order today, isn't it? It is. Some of the u uniforms will be very difficult, I imagine. Well... There's a, a, a marvellous shot of the bass drummer there. He'll expend he looks quite a bit of energy. 
Now, a lot of the bands, I think, have spare bass drummers, don't they, Walter? Um, by the time that you get up to Barnet Domain, you must be very tired and uh, gone through a few drum heads. Oh, this is an excellent view of a, of a Highland uh, regimental band. And very much in a, in a Highland doublet, Argyle cuffs, Glengarry's, and Trues. Very, uh, very unusual band. Well, this is the scene here in central Belfast, but meantime in Marafelt, Ralph McLean joins us again. Thank you very much, Walter. You're very welcome back to Macrofelt. I'm joined uh, by David Hume from the Grand Orange Lodge of Ireland. David, a massive day for the town of Macrofelt. Yes, a big, big day and a fantastic day for it, of course, with the weather that they're having. It's just brilliant. A lot of shirt sleeves out today. It'll be tough going for a lot of people, uh, parading and marching on a day like this, because the heat is serious, isn't it? Yes, it will be. It'll be something we're not really used to, um, and particularly for the bands as well. Of course, a lot of bands have uniforms. They can't uh, go in shirt sleeves, some of the bands. So particularly pipe bands would be very heavy going, I suspect. But at least it's quite a flat route. And of course, compared to the, the city parades and compared to what happens in somewhere like Belfast, there's a different vibe when you come out here to Macrofelt, isn't there? What makes it different, a country parade, from a, a city one? I think the first thing is the variety of bands. Uh, you have pipe bands, silver bands, accordion bands, flute bands here. Um, so you have a wide variety of musical instruments. In Belfast, they can't really have that because of the length of the parade, so it's, it's mainly flute bands. Um, so I think that's the first thing. I think there's also a stronger sense, perhaps, of, of community here in terms of where the lodges are from and uh, so on. That It's very significant in country areas as well. And In country areas, there's often a generational aspect to the lodges, much more than there might be in Belfast even. Uh, so I think that's all part of the mix here. And of course that great sort of laid back country vibe as well is, is pretty hard to beat. What about numbers? We can see it's a big day, that's obvious, but what sort of numbers are we talking to? Well, um, it's, it's a county demonstration, so the, the county would know better in terms of the actual numbers, but it will be a large demonstration um, because of that. Um, I wouldn't like to hazard a guess in terms of the actual numbers I have. I think the county master would probably be better to, to speak on that one, but um, it's certainly a, there is a more laid back sense to it. You see, uh, I think that, but also I know it today that uh, they started at a quarter to eleven as they said they would, uh, so they're not that laid back. <laughs> laid back but tight all the same. David, it's been great to see you again. Your chief speaker at the field. I'll let you get on with your duties. In the meantime, hand you back to Walter in Belfast. And as the parade takes a break, we can have a look at pictures recorded earlier of the wreath laying ceremony at the Cenotaph in the grounds of the City Hall, honouring those who gave their lives in two world wars and in the line of duty throughout the Troubles. The wreath laying ceremony at the Cenotaph a little earlier this morning. George Chittick, County Grand Master, Spencer Beatty, Deputy Grand Master, and the Reverend Martin Smith, past Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Ireland, and, and chaplain with county officers in attendance as well. Uh, Gavin, uh, July is the month, of course, when we all remember the Somme, 1st of July, so it's an important part of uh, the, the orange events of the day. It is, and it's one of those um, events that you have to really remember what the Somme actually was. I mean, at 7.30 on the 1st of July 1916, thousands of British soldiers clambered over their own parapets and steadily walked towards the German lines. Most were experienced volunteer soldiers, and by the end of the first day, some 60,000 men were killed, missing or wounded. One grim statistic simply notes this as one casualty for every 18 inches of the front line. And, of course, by midday, um, the Ulster Division had broken through, the only British division to do so, and secured their fifth-line German offense, uh, objectives. But it was at a terrible cost, Walter. 9,000 men had gone over the top on the 1st of July, and by the 3rd of July, it was confirmed that over 5,000 had become casualties. And, of course, uh, 
the, many of those who fell at the Somme were from all over Ireland. It wasn't just Ulstermen. It was a very significant day here, but uh, there were many casualties from the entire island. That's right. I mean, the, the, the Battle of the Somme was a, as a huge battle. It ended in September when um, the 16th Irish Division captured the fortified villages of Guilmont and Ginching. Well, in the street now, in Bedford Street, Helen Mark has someone else to talk to. I have a whole crowd to talk to, Walter, and very international one at that. So you are? I'm Sam from Australia. Sam from Australia. I'm Kyle from England, Newcastle. Newcastle upon Tyne, and? Patrick from Switzerland. Uh huh. And Karen, also from Switzerland. Are you together? Yeah. Yes, yes. Lovely. Have you ever seen an orange parade before? No, it's the first time. And what are your thoughts? Oh, uh, it's very impressive. Yeah. yeah. And yourself? Yeah, also very strange because we haven't seen that before. Had you heard of Orange Parades? Um, yes, but um, just a newspaper, maybe a few years ago, and we didn't recognize um, uh, when we arrived to, to Ireland that, that ah. it's going to be on the 12th of July. So it's more like uh, lucky to be in Belfast now. Good, lovely. Well, enjoy the parade. So, Kyle, I know you've got somebody back in Newcastle who might get a bit of a shock when you appear on screen. Uh, yeah, my granddad's watching me back in Newcastle, so... Hello, Grandad. How are you doing? <laughs> and what about yourself, Kyle? What do you think of the event? Oh, it's brilliant. The crowds are enormous today. I mean, you see them here. It's absolutely enormous. Um, I've seen the parade before in um, Scotland, um, Glasgow, and it was nowhere near the size of this. It's brilliant, and the weather's out, sun's shining, excellent. So. You look upon them, they're marching past, there's great music going on. And Sam, what about yourself? Yeah, it's wonderful. It's you know something you never expect to see it's somewhere like this. Are you visiting or Yeah, visiting for a few months, so doing a working holiday. So it's um it's an amazing atmosphere. And as, what about the music? What do you think of that? Oh, it's great. It's it's awesome. Yeah, I love the Irish music and it's yeah, really um, strong. Yeah. Yeah. And and Kyle, Kyle, is this new music to you? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's brilliant, the, the way the coordination, the uniforms, everything, everything's so brilliant, smart, lovely, lovely day. Yeah, well turned out. Well, there's a lot of bands to go past, so you have plenty to watch for the rest of the, the morning, so thanks Can't for wait. stopping to speak to us. Back to you, Walter. <laughs> Thank you, Helen, and uh, this is again the view along Bedford Street, packed with people, huge crowds here. I don't think there's room for any more people on the pavements here. I don't think so, Walter. And here we see the Kelvin Howe Covenanters flute band just passing. A very striking band indeed. Marking time for a moment. We get these occasional pauses in the in the marching. You do. Very distinctive caps there. Reminiscent of. Um, the WPC caps we see uh, in, in evidence today. We'll just savour the atmosphere here, the, the music bouncing off the buildings either side of Bedford Street and the Dublin Road. change of drummer there. That's obviously the That's, way to do it. Yes, it is, isn't it? Pacing themselves. <laughs> 2013 is a special year for the County Grand Orange Lodge of Belfast as it celebrates its 150th anniversary. Ralph's been finding out more. In years gone by, the Belfast Parade would take hours to wind its way through the city. These days, the parade is noticeably smaller, but the city still resonates to the sound of bands and marching feet. All the city's lodges belong to Belfast County Grand Orange Lodge. This is their 150th anniversary, an important milestone for George Chittick. George, good to see you. Good to see you all. Thanks for showing us around this amazing hall. What have we got in this room now? Well, this is a Grosvenor Road uh, LOL 970 Bonner. And you can see Carson himself there right at the centre. That's correct. That's the sign of the Ulster Covenant on the 28th of September 1912. 
the county was formed in 1863. But there was Orange Lodges in Sandy Row, and I have evidence of it, in 1796. Now this lodge is clearly steeped in history, but I think we need to go to Clifton Street. Will you take us up there? Oh, no problem. Well, here at Clifton Street, you can't help but notice King William towering over everything. It's a very important statue, that, George. The statue is a, a replica of all that King William wore at the Battle of the Boyne, and it was made by Harry Helms of Exeter for a cost of £800. And the 150th anniversary, what does that mean to you personally? Six generations of orange men in the city of Belfast and we're still going strong. There's no denying that the Orange Order is very much a part of the fabric of the city of Belfast, but how do historians see it? Eamon, how significant is the order in the history of this city? Oh, it goes back to the Industrial Revolution of the mid-19th century, when oranges that was imported into Belfast from rural Ulster, really, it becomes even more important when Storm was established in the 1920s. Every Unionist MP, every Cabinet Minister to the very top, has to be a member of the Orange Order. But of course, in recent years, with the troubles, with demographic change, with social change, Orangeism is declining in numbers year on year. But I think as it declines, it will still remain part of that rich tapestry of Irish history. The drama, the colour, the energy of the Belfast period just leaps from this picture. It's by Belfast artist Joe McWilliams, and he's taken endless inspiration from the 12th. It's colour and moving colour, uh, which is really why I started painting the 12th Monet, painted haystacks numerous times. And it's what, what gets a painter going. They're part of my life, part of our everyday. And here we're back again in our familiar view along Bedford Street. Just a reminder, by the way, that you can keep up to date with events throughout the day on BBC Newsline, Radio Ulster and, of course, online. And we're now, we've moved into District Number 9 uh, after 7 and 8. A uh, smallish district, this one with eight lodges. They have seven bands marching today and it includes one ladies' district as well. Yes, we just saw um, 739 there, West Belfast, the banner of the West Belfast Orange Hall, and of course, just in the back, just a little feature there of them signing the uh, Ulster Covenant. And this is a new banner unfurled on the 8th of June last year, Walter. I'm sure it's a fairly expensive business, uh, having a new banner. They were silk originally. I don't know whether they use more synthetic materials today. Well, I think it's sort of in... Um, in the original banners of the day, they would have started with silk or cloth uh, painted banners. And of course, uh, on a wet day, there are problems, so at least they don't have that to worry about today at the moment. But now we're moving from Belfast to Mahrafelt again, and over to Ralph McClay. Thank you, Walter, and welcome back to sunny Mackerfelt. It's all going great here. I'm joined by County Grandmaster for London, Derry, Hugh Stewart. Hugh, I want to get an idea of the scale of this event here today. Give me some of the numbers. Ralph, uh, very good morning to you. It's a pleasure to welcome you here to Mackerfelt. Numbers-wise, we have eight districts in Mackerfelt. That uh, culminates about 66 lodges and bands, and I guess about in the region of 4,000 brethren and bandsmen, and probably in the region of about 6,000 visitors. And in terms of the atmosphere here, it's a really strong family vibe. People are out with the parasols, they've got the motorhomes out along the sides of the street. It's a wonderful atmosphere here in the town today. It's absolutely wonderful, Ralph, to see it. Uh, this started yesterday morning, I believe, about 8 o'clock, and it just increased during the day. And if anyone didn't make it this morning, they'd, they'd miss the spacing effectively. It's just great to, to see the number of folk here. What is it that makes this procession special, do you think, and a special place in your heart? Well, especially to, to come out and to, to celebrate our culture forefathers and days gone by and just to be here and remember the Re Reformation and the Protestant heritage which we have, Ralph. And you've got a busy day ahead of you. It's only really starting for you, isn't it? You... 
it's uh, coming to a, a culmination in the, the afternoon, I suppose, with the, the platform events and then the wind down uh, of the parade back and finishing off this evening. It's absolutely wonderful. Maherafeld District have done a wonderful job, if I may say so myself, and it's a pleasure to see the other seven districts here with us to celebrate the 12th of July demonstration today. Now, if you had to sell Maherafeld to people perhaps who haven't been to the procession here today, what would you say? How would you tell people to come along? We have folk here today, Ralph, from as far afield as Australia, Canada, United States, and indeed Scotland. And, you know, it, it, you've just got to be here to realise the, the, the atmosphere and the culture that we have here. It's absolutely wonderful. Well, have a great rest of the day, Hugh. Wish you all the very best. Back to you, Walter, in Belfast. Thank you, Ralph. And uh, we've now moved of the ten districts represented in the Belfast Parade we now come to district number 10 from Bananafai. There are seven lodges in the district and they have five bands with them and one ladies district. Uh, I should say that uh, of the 10 districts, uh, they rotate each year. So we started with district number six uh, this year, which means that after this district, we'll be going to one and then on up through the, through the numbers. Six miles they uh, march from Clifton Street to Barnes Domain, fairly flat, a little bit downhill into town, then it's level, a uh, small climb perhaps up the Lisburn Road, uh, no steep hills, but it's quite an undertaking on a hot day like today. It very much is, isn't it? And we just saw um, the, the head of the district there carrying a replica of the Ballon of Fire Newton Breeder Ulster Volunteer Force Battalion Standard of 1913. So there are lots of people enjoying themselves out there, Walter, aren't they? Very much so indeed. I mean, this is a day to be out in the sunshine. I hope they remember their sun cream. Obviously, you're getting a little bit of support there to, to view the parade. Now, this band is uh, very royal, very marine orientated taking its cue, I think, from the, from the American Marines. One of the, the bands uh, near the head of District Number 10, uh, one of the lodges, Derrimore Purple Star, uh, had a, a very famous member, the late Dean uh, Sammy Crooks of Belfast Cathedral, he was a member of the lodge, he was the original Santa, raised thousands of pounds for charity. Once again, in the crowd here, uh, in front of us, right in front of the BBC here in, in uh, Ormo Avenue and, and Dublin Road and, and Bedford Street, Helen Marks have somebody to talk to. Well, here I am with Mark Wilson, who I have known long enough. I thought he might have brought me an ice cream, but he didn't. I'll but buy you an ice cream later, <laughs> Helen, absolutely. You're very welcome, and it's lovely to see you. And uh, you've been standing watching the bands going past. I have, and I've been really enjoying myself, Helen. Uh, one of the best bands on parade today is just about to go past us, uh, Born Young Defenders from Kilkeel. Really great band, great drumline, well tuned, on the beat, playing with great anticipation. A really good band. I wonder what the heat does to the drum skin, if anything. Well, the heat, it depends on, I suppose, the age of the drum. And some of the older drums, and I see there is a, a kind of a penchant for some of the bands to go back to the older style drums that have proper calfskin heads. And they will expand and contract a lot with the heat or with moisture or whatever. And that will change the tone of the drum. The more modern drum, like you've seen in the band just past, that will pretty much keep its tension 
all day today. But of course, that heat will cause heads to expand and there will be heads break. Not through the drumming, but just through the heat of the head. And what about the standard of the music, Mark? I, Helen, I have really noticed an increase in the standard of music this year. Um, the bands really have their practice well. I mean, they're marching. The, how they look, their uniforms are immaculate, their marching is really, really good, very impressive. And I know there's been a lot of focus on that from various groups like the Ulster Scots Agency, the Arts Council, all these people who have given money to help the band look well, and now, now they're actually beginning to sound a lot better year after year after year. So with a musical standard that's getting better and increasing, that's fabulous. That's, that's the way ahead. And it's where you started at the front of the band, and you become this great drummer that we we know yeah. and love Mark and it is Thanks, so Helen. lovely to speak to you here on the parade so back to you Walter thank you very much Helen and uh, certainly uh, drumming and drummers are very much a part of what's going on here and and everywhere else very smart and precise band here with uh, good military style uniform very much so it's uh, a, a very impressive core of drums there, Walter. And there you are. That's just to show you where we are now. The linen quarter refers, of course, to all those linen warehouses. I'm afraid they've all gone now. Somebody once told me that uh, at six o'clock in Ormo Avenue, in years gone by, the pavements were packed with people leaving the factories and heading home. Usually walking home. Usually walking, that's yeah. right. Indeed. And everybody's oh, yes. involved. A uh, couple of <laughs> Some teddy Royal Irish there. Regiment teddy bears there. Right. The orange lily still still evident. Uh, of course, it's been good weather for them this year too. Healthy, healthy flowers. It has, and again, of course, and the Britannia the flute band. Flute band. They're accompanying the uh, Sons of Ulster, Sons of Belfast. Sorry, seven four three. Lol. Um, the front of their banner, if you catch it, is the Belfast City Hall. Oh, and there you are. I think uh, that's an interesting one. He, is, is he a drummer? I don't know. I, th I think he might be a lamb bag drummer. Yeah. Well, talking of drummers, uh, we're going back again to Mount Rafelt where we've identified and found a lamb bag drummer. Thank you, Walter. We have indeed. Trevor Robinson's the man. I promised you about a lamb bag drums earlier on in the programme. Trevor, who are you marching with today? I'm marching with uh, Les Lee, uh, Purple Marks man, in the Curry District. Now, you have been playing the drums for just a few years, and it's important to you to get back in that tradition and to bring it back to the parade today. Yes, uh, we just started uh, the, the drums, uh, just coming up now in almost three years, uh, and uh, we're just sort of learning, learning, learning the skills and learning how to build them. It's an amazing thing. I always think it's an incredible skill as well. It's a very different skill from ordinary drumming too. So how long did it take you to put the drum together? Because you've got to do that as well. It's all part of the magic. And then to learn. How long are we talking? Well, you'll probably learn the basics uh, with, within a year. Uh, learn sometimes, but it's, it's further development as you go along uh, over, over the years. You'll, you'll not learn this overnight, uh, so you won't, but it's uh, just continual development. So the best part of a year to put the drum together and get to the basic stage, and then you're really learning from there on in. Now, you had a bit of a crisis last night, didn't you? You lost the head on it. You had to do a late run to Lisburn, I think. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, thanks to uh, James Cowsley there in Khalid. Uh, he's one of the top drum makers in County Antrim there. He uh, sorted me out with a head. Um, because uh, these drums are sizes. So there. And of course the weight as well, and on a beautiful hot day, you must have wished perhaps you played a different instrument, because what weight are we talking that you've got on your body when you're playing the lambic? Yeah, five and a half kgs, uh, so, so there is now. I, uh, I don't know what that is in imperial measurement, but it's very heavy. A day like this, it's, it's heavy. Well, we've uh, let you not put it on for the chat, but you're going to hook it on now. So go for it, Trevor. You're going to play us a little bit of uh, authentic Lambeg drumming here on the program from Mackerfeld. In your own time, I'm going to make myself scarce. Go for it, Trevor.
Well, there you are, Lambeck drummer in Matter of Felt. Sorry about the slight interruption to the sound there, but we've got our own drummers here too, and they come beautifully decorated, beautifully dressed for the occasion, and of all ages, trainee drummer. It's, it's nice to see. I'm sure there must have been a few Lambegs leaving Bambridge uh, this morning for Loch Britland, Walter. It's sort of... Now, if you want to find out more about the history of the Orange Order, plans are underway to develop interpretive centres in County Armagh and Belfast with the assistance of £3.6 million pounds in EU funding. Here's Ralph. This is Schomburg House, the headquarters of the Grand Orange Lodge of Ireland. Now, as you can see, it's already a very imposing building, but trust me when I tell you, it's about to become even more impressive. Ralph, welcome to Schomburg House. You're the man with all the plans, literally, for this. Big things coming, what can you tell us? These are the plans for in development for the capital work at Schomburg House and the interpretive design for both our interpretive centres here at Schomburg House and also at Sloan's House and it's for the development of museums and educational resources that uh, are part of this Peace 3 funded programme uh, to encourage greater understanding about the traditions of Orangeism. We want to create, if you like, the complete visitor experience and if you pop your gloves on there Ralph, because no you're mm -hmm. going to be touching some original material. What are we going to look at first? First of all, if you'd like to pick that up Ralph, you're mm -hmm. now holding the last letter that William III wrote before he left uh, the mainland to come to Ireland in 1690. Wow. To I can hold this okay? You can hold that, trust yes. Me. I trust you indeed, Ralph. It's in French and it talks about him waiting for money and fair wind and horses uh, to come and prosecute the war. Yeah, that is King Billy's signature. That's We're the seeing his image of the man himself here all around the room. That's the signature. These really are priceless artefacts. And as we speak, the boxes are being unpacked, stuff's being bubble wrapped. It's all go here, isn't it? At the moment, we're creating an inventory of everything we have, trying to establish everything's provenance. And there are a lot of boxes here, there and yonder in the building. A lot of these items have been donated into the Grand Orange Lodge of Ireland by members of the institution or families and organisations. For example, the Paymaster General's account book uh, for the Williamite period in Ireland. You know, the nice wee pieces there to payment to William Fuller for secret service, another one for private intelligence during the Williamite Wars in Ireland. You're getting a little insight into the secretive world of that period as well. I mean, these gauntlets are Williams, aren't they? They are indeed, And yes. I mean, they look absolutely perfect. Well made originally, obviously. Absolutely. Stitching's perfect, isn't it? If you're making it for a king, Ralph, obviously it has to last for a while. <laughs> Slightly better than these, then. Slightly better than Slightly the gloves we're wearing today. And this, am I right to say, Jonathan, a toasting goblet Certainly a rather big one, but is that what we're talking about? The Mammoth Goblet uh, dates prior to 1750. In memory of King William III, would this have been full of mead then at the time? I like to think it would, but would it? Never let the facts get in the way of good stories. So in terms of this development and the development at Sloan's House as well then, Jonathan, what would you like people to take from this? We want to use the artefacts that we have to tell the story of oranges and to myth-bust a little bit about the orange and its traditions and its legacy and place in the modern world. And we want to encourage everyone to come and see what the what will be as part of these two centres. Well, it's living history and this is a great way to do it. Thank you very much indeed. Well, Ralph said it's all go there, and it certainly is in central Belfast here, this vivid spectacle of colour and music. Wonder wonderful music that is coming up the street to us and passing us by and on down the Dublin Road. And there's a lovely shot of the banner of Clover Hill Temperance, Walton, LOL 455. The original warrant is unknown, but it could date far as back as 1795, which of course is the year that the Orange Order came out of County Armagh. And the very first twelfths were actually um, in Portadown, Lurgan and Waringstown, Walter. Many of the tunes uh, being played on the 12th of July uh, come from the time of the First World War, don't they? They do, and uh, that's possibly you know, not surprising, really, considering the fact that they're very, um, very easy to march to. You know, they're sort of things like It's a Long Way to Tipperary, it's an old music hall song, 
written by Jack Judge, allegedly written for a five-shilling bet in Staleybridge on the 30th of January and performed the next night at the local music hall. And on the 13th of August 1914, the Connaught Rangers were witness marching through Boulogne singing this. So it was reported in the Daily Mail and the rest, as they say, Walter, is history. It is history indeed. Well, look at this. The people who parked themselves here earlier this morning, it's a, it's a long spell to be sitting in the sun, but what a lovely morning to, for, for sitting out and enjoying the spectacle. It is. And there's, there's not many ice creams on display, though. <laughs> no. Not much need for an umbrella, but no. uh, mind you, they are useful for shading the sun, too. And a little quiet lull now. Things go quiet from time to time. And I know that uh, Helen has found somebody else to talk to, so let's go over to Helen now in the crowd. In the crowd, oh, aren't the crowds absolutely vast? And there are people who come from all arts and parts, well, to be here on this particular day. And let me introduce... Francois, from France. From France, where about? Uh, in the north of France. In the north of France. And yourself? I'm um, Sally from Indonesia. And how is it that you come to be in Northern Ireland this particular week? It was awesome because it's my first time seeing this carnival. It's the first time seeing the carnival and I presume the first time in Northern Ireland. Yeah, yeah, yeah the first time in England. <laughs> Yeah. And how have you seen much else of Northern Ireland on your trip here? Uh, we arrived on uh, yesterday, so we just saw the city centre and I, I, I went to W5 yesterday. It was a great, great event. We're here for a week, we visit a friend and uh, it looks nice. We are, we are lucky with the weather, so yeah. we're happy. And so many great things to see and go and yeah. do in Northern Ireland. What do you think of the parades, Sam? It was really colourful. I never seen something like this before. What about yourself, Francois? Uh, on the morning we were on the, at home and we heard the music, so we decided to go out and really great. From the youngest to the oldest people, great atmosphere, it's a really nice event, really. And you've got your camera, you'll be hoping to get some good snaps. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm really trying to get the best snap I can get here. So that you can take them home to Indonesia and let yeah, them see. Yeah, them. I will let my friend know about this parade. Um, it's lovely to speak to you. Thank you very much for stopping by with us. Back to you, Walter. Thank you, Helen. Well, carnival, parade, walk or march, uh, it's all spectacle today. And I, I'm sure for visitors coming for the very first time, it is uh, an amazing spectacle of colour and, and, and music. Well, it truly is a, a remarkable um, event, isn't it, Walter? It's the kind of thing that... Um it's, it's hard to explain to, to, to any viewer um, or spectator who isn't, um, who isn't here today. I mean, I must admit, I, I don't think I've ever seen Bedford Street as crowded. And... Uh I don't know how people feel when they've done two miles in this heat uh, and knowing that they've got another four to go and then they've got six miles on the way back again. I know. Late, later in the afternoon. Uh, we're, we're just actually seeing um, images there of, um, of Angelo Davison Memorial. Um, Angelo Davison was killed in action at the Battle of the Somme. Another of the very distinctively dressed uh, bands. The smart caps. And many women enjoying themselves. <laughs> with, with a glass a of water. Time. <laughs> and big smiles all round. Now, the 12th of July has had a long tradition of father and son walking in the parade. Claire McCollum has been to meet one well known son and his dad. banks of the River Thames in London and I'm here to meet a father and son who are orange men through and through. One of them will be known to you as a top international sports star. William and Alan Campbell, great to see you here down by the Thames. It's, it's your home club. Um, Alan, you've been having such a great time. A great year, really, hasn't it been? Yeah, I mean, it was, um, you know, this time last year, I was uh, not having the smoothest of seasons, and, uh, you know, the, the Olympics was looking, you know, tenuous at that point, but 
you know, we uh, I had great support and uh, people sort of gathered behind me and, uh, you know, I came away with uh, a hard-fought bronze and uh, here I am, now three and a half years out from uh, from the Rio Olympic Games and uh, looking to go two better and get a gold. Fingers crossed. Of course, while rowing is, is right up there in your life, Alan, one of your greatest loves, you're both, you and your father, both proud to be orange men. Oh, very much so. It's a long-standing tradition uh, for us and our family, and uh, I'm proud to carry on that tradition. I walked my first 12th when I was uh, four. I think Dad said he walked his first when he was three, so he did. So, yeah, there's, there's competitiveness in the family. I remember walking as a boy, and you know, tea and sandwiches never tasted as good as they did on the 12th of July because you, know, you felt like a man having walked you know, with all the, all the men on that day. William, you must be very, very proud of Alan. Yes, very proud of him, very proud of him and his rowing achievements, but proud also that he's a member of the Orange Order. All four of Alan's great-grandfathers were in the Orange Order, and uh, it's nice that the tradition's fallen on. I'm not sure whether Alan will be a district master living in London or not, but he's heading the right direction anyway. How important is it that Alan is a role model for, for the younger ones who maybe are thinking about joining the Orange? Well, us older guys like to think we're role models for the younger ones, but Alan's a real role model and uh, setting an example to others. To be honest, my dad's a bit of a role model to me, so as you know, and uh, my parents have been fantastic because, you know, they're, they're not rich, they're not famous, but they're good people and they work hard and, you know, that was values that were instilled in me um, and I feel you know my mum and dad got those values from the church and from partly from the Orange Order as well and so, you know, I think also then for young people coming through I think there isn't really a greater sort of uh, you know identity than, than that of the church and the values that they've instilled uh, and that you know obviously the Orange Order is based on the Bible and so you know it's it's win-win. And on the 12th of July you'll be walking as usual William? Yes in Maherfeld and South London Dairy Parade. And would you be able to join them? Unfortunately not, but I will be in Switzerland and hopefully not at a walking pace. I'm actually racing uh, as part of the, the last part of our World Cup series. But, you know, I always do get a phone call, ask Dad how good the sandwiches and the tea are. <laughs> and uh, to be honest, I, I've never actually been homesick, but the only day of the year I do get homesick, and I don't know what it is, is on the 12th of July. Well, all the best in Lucerne and all the best for the Thank 12th. You Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, isn't it interesting to see how many young people, very young people here, are participating? And I'm sure these youngsters will have of memories that will last for them for a long time, having experienced their first or second or third twelfth at, at, at that age. Well, this is it. I mean, it's a, a great opportunity for fathers and sons to, to parade together and, uh, and to enjoy the day. When we get to uh, the, the field, when the, the, the parade reaches the field at Barnes Domain, there is, of course, a religious service, and there are three resolutions on faith, on loyalty and state, and presentation of band awards. So everything gets underway uh, early afternoon, and then at 4.15 they begin the return journey. Well, time to go back again to Mauerfeld and to join Ralph McLean. Thank you, Walter. Well, rower Alan Campbell may not have made it to the parade today, but lots of other people have. And so much of this is about family and about visitors coming as well. And I have two lovely ladies from Scotland with me now, Anne and Georgia. Lovely to see you girls. Now, Anne, you're Scottish, but you live here and have done for a wee bit. That's right. I um, moved over here in 2005 to look after my husband's mother. But it's been a family tradition for us to come to the 12th every year including mum that's departed. She did that right up to her 101st birthday. So she made the 12th at 101. 101 years of age and just missed it for the following year. Or so, But always been a family tradition. Always had family coming over for the 12th. And even since my husband was a wee boy, he has continued to come over every year without fail. Fantastic, Georgia. I love your headgear. I take it you wore that specially, or is it just a coincidence? Where are you coming from in Scotland then? Livingston. And how many years have you been coming over, Anne's here, obviously since 2005, but you come over to visit, don't you? Oh, just three years. And what's it like? It must be a great feeling to get together with the family. Beautiful. Beautiful. Everybody's lovely to you here. There is a real family atmosphere, and, and today you're a good example of that because you have the whole family here, the whole brood here, and you're all going to be getting together over the course of the day. It's a bit special, really. That's right. And then more eats and we've got the paddling pool ready to go back to and the ice lollies and the freezer and just make a big day of it and it continues back into tomorrow as well so 
the family have been over here for the whole week. They've made a week's holiday of this, so they don't go home till Sunday. So the sunshine's great, but you guys would be here anyway, wouldn't you? Rain or shine? Rain or shine, we'd be here. We'd always be here for the 12th. We brought our umbrellas, we brought our jackets. Every eventuality has been covered for for today. <laughs> and Georgia, there's such a great relationship between Scotland and here, isn't there? It's nice to celebrate that. Smashing. Everybody's so nice here. Almost like being at home for you, isn't it? Yeah, everybody. Lots of great headgear as well. Ladies, enjoy the rest of the day with the family. It's great to see you here. You I'll hand you back. Uh, yeah, we're all having a fabulous time here. Back to Walter in Belfast. Thank you, Ralph. And uh, sorry about the little interruption to the pictures there. It must be the heat, I think. But uh, anyway, we get most of it there, OK? Um, there are a number of uh, other uh, fraternal connections in the, with the Orange Order, aren't there? There are, Walter. I mean, it's often thought that the Orange are the first to celebrate the 12th of July. But it had actually been commemorated by an even older fraternal organisation called the Loyal and Friendly Society of the Blue and Orange. This was a military society formed in 1727 from members of the 4th King's Own Regiment of Foot. This regiment was the first to give loyalty to William and fought at the Battle of the Boyne and Ockram. Well, the, there's a, a lot of history associated with all of we're seeing here today. And uh, current history comes from Helen Mark in the crowd. Helen. The guest that I'm with now, Walter, is David Montgomery of SE Musical. And I know as the bands have been going past, you'll recognize quite a lot of the faces because you help outfitting them with all bits and pieces of their regalia, David. Yeah, um, everything from uniforms, drums, flutes, drumsticks, leg lathers, you name it, we do it. Hats, the whole lot. And not just Belfast band. Oh, no, no, our customer base, um, Scotland. Um, all parts of Northern Ireland. Um, we recently just finished the uniform yesterday for Ballymena Cora Drums. And does it get a bit hectic at the last minute, you know, people thinking, oh, I've left my gloves on the bus or on the boat, I need a new pair. Um, the, the, yes, there was guys in yesterday getting snares for their drums and gloves, yeah, that's quite normal. So you're seeing some of your uniforms walk past and it's maybe all right for the guys in short sleeve shirts, but there are, there are people going past in really thick cloth tunics. Whoa. Yeah, I actually, to come do this interview, I walked down behind Young Loyalists, big band from Pollock in Glasgow, and they last season got a total military tunic, high collar tunic, and they made the decision today that they would keep their smart military appearance by wearing it, and I walked down behind them. Yeah, and there's been quite a few comments about how smart the bands are looking. Yeah, well a lot of bands um, obviously pride themselves in their, their appearance, and they spend quite a lot of money to achieve that. A lot of money. Yes, it, it can run into thousands. Well, I know that your parade is coming up, at, your, your lodge is coming up at the very end of the parade, so I'll let you get away to join them. And it is nice to see you once again, David. Thank you and very all much. the best. Thanks, Back Alan. to you, Walter. Thank you, Helen. Now, the BBC has been covering the 12th on television for over 50 years. And now we can take a trip back in time, courtesy of the archive. There's a lovely picture of the City Hall there, Walter. Yes, it hasn't changed a lot. There's what used to be Robinson Cleaver's building, still remembered by that name, and some of the wonderful costumes that uh, people use. There are the lamb Lambegs, bags, drums which are the, are you the don't fighter. see in Belfast now, but they were in those days. And, of course, the orange arches, which still appear in many, many areas around the city. And the very large bands. Extremely large bands yeah. there. And uh, again, and a lovely view there of the, uh, of the young drummer major there. I wonder if he ended up being a drum major. And yeah, there's still a lot of sense of fun, even in those days, too. Interesting looking at the black and white pictures, and then moving back again to colour. And some energy being expended there. And we can see how many uh, brethren were parading in, in the ages of colour. And the good crowds, this is again the view of where we are today. There were still decent crowds then, but I think we, we, we can beat them this year. This is a lovely picture there of a colour guard and colour escort with their, with their sabres. Not seen now, the sabres. And going right back in time there, and there's Clifton Street, Orange Hall, where it all began this morning at 10 o'clock. And we're back live here in Bedford Street. 
And we're now on to District 5, Sandy Row, which is uh, one of the largest uh, districts with 27 lodges and 14 bands, again with one ladies' district in attendance as well. Again, we get the little pause occasionally as the parade backs up a little bit. I'm not sure if anybody's ever measured the actual length of the parade from beginning to end. <laughs> it's a couple of miles, anyway. You, you would certainly think so. I mean, certainly watching it as they come past uh, our position here in the commentary box, do you think that it's, it's a, a mass of, of bands and, and uh, lodges? They're just marking time there. Yeah. Good shirt sleeve order again, appropriate to the day. You would definitely need it. And the caps come into their own on a day like this. Another of the Scottish visiting lodges. That's the Martyrs of the Grass Market. Uh, that's uh, an area very close into Edinburgh Castle. It, it is. I'm just hearing the, the strains of Follow the Van, uh, yeah. Mary Lloyd uh, classic. So uh, there's everything really from military music to popular tunes to hymn tunes. Too. There is. There's a wide variety of music uh, being played today. It's a tradition of the, the parade that it will take a break and it looks as if, in fact, uh, we've reached that point now where the, the main parade here will rest for a few minutes and then continue on its way. That's right, as, the, uh, as they catch up. And now we're going back again to Helen. Helen Mark. I have just met a lovely group of young students from America, and they are Kayla, Katie, Amanda, Kate, and one of them told me earlier on that they have rather a nice tradition in parades in, where is it? In America, our parades, the people that are marching throw candy at the audience so that we can, I don't know, enjoy it. <laughs> that is a good thing to do. We'll maybe try and get that organized for next year. Yeah. So are you on holiday here? Uh, we're actually here studying with St. Lawrence University. We're studying um, the conflict between Southern and Northern Ireland. So this is kind of the pinnacle of that for us. And so you wanted to come and see the parade for what reason? We just wanted to learn about the culture and the traditions. And what do you think about the parade? Uh, well, I really like all of the different sections of, I don't know, the just showing support for each different group. Are you going to manage to fit in other things when you're here in Northern Ireland? Yes, we're going to the Giants Causeway tomorrow. Oh, lovely. It's absolutely fantastic. And you'll take in some of our coastline along there when you're there. Yeah. Is this is this a first time to Northern Ireland? Absolutely, yes. It's been absolutely amazing. And the weather, my gosh, we're all worried about bringing rain boots and rain jackets. And this is incredible. It's absolutely lovely. And the, the huge crowds that we've got here this year, are you impressed by what's happening? Yes, it's it's big and it's exciting and there's so much energy and it's great to just experience the culture. Yeah. And what about the music? What do you think of the music? I really like the music and uh, I like the flutes a lot. And that's all we have time for. You can watch this program on BBC iPlayer and we have a very special program on BBC Northern Ireland tonight at 10.35. But from all the team in Macrofelton here in Belfast, a very, very good afternoon.